Welcome everyone to this Zoom lecture hosted by the Center for the Study of Governance and Society here at uh, King's. My name is Mark Pennington and I'm the director of the center. One of our core research themes at the center is to look at the relationship between formal and informal institutions of governance. We've had a number of speakers who've looked at that intersection over the last couple of years but we haven't had many speakers who've looked at that relationship in the context of social service provision or in the context of the Middle East. So I'm delighted that we have with us today, Professor Melanie Kamet from Harvard University. Melanie's books include Compassionate Communitarianism, Welfare and Sectarianism in Lebanon, The Politics of Non-State Welfare in the Global South, and globalization and business politics in North Africa. I think she's a leading expert on welfare provision in the Middle East, and I'm delighted to have us with have have her here with us. Um, well, it's this evening in the UK, but in the afternoon for people in other parts of the world. So Melanie's going to speak for about uh, 40 to 45 minutes. We will take questions after she's finished. She's she's finished speaking. But in the meantime, if you would like to put your questions in the comments box or the chat box, we'll collect those up at the end of the session and Melanie will answer them then. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Melanie Kamet. Melanie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I really appreciate the invitation and thanks for showing up on Zoom to everyone participating. Uh, I'm going to share my slides, um, so let me know how that goes. Can everyone see? Okay, excellent. So, um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, a paper that is from a project I've uh, spearheaded with a PhD candidate in my department at Harvard, I2 Shashmaz, and a number of other collaborators uh, for the broader project. Um, in Lebanon and in the United States. And, um, and the focus today is on a project that looks at the experience of Syrian refugees in uh, service delivery centers in Lebanon. The title of our paper, as you can see, is Equity with Prejudice, International NGOs and Service Delivery in Refugee Crises. So, um, so we know from the growing literature uh, that refugees often face resentment and hostility in host communities. This is uh, documented um, in a number of studies in the European context and in the Middle East, and this is definitely a growth area literature uh, in the social sciences. Uh, and it seems to be kind of the baseline finding, the becoming almost the conventional wisdom that for a variety of reasons, refugees face hostility in their host communities, whether it's because of economic concerns or cultural concerns or security concerns, a variety of factors lead to these kinds of attitudes uh, with corresponding behaviors in, in some instances. Um, but we also know from a few studies um, that we can see fair treatment of refugees and sometimes people exhibit altruistic attitudes towards them and even behaviors. And so the question is, when does this occur and why? Um, so in this paper, we focus on how refugees experience social service delivery in the countries where they go. And more specifically, we look at the case of Syrian refugees uh, in Lebanese healthcare institutions. Um, so let me just uh, give you a kind of uh, background on relevant theory here to set up the various hypotheses that we test and to um, uh, establish the intuitions that guide this paper. So as I said, the conventional wisdom seems to be that refugees experience discrimination uh, in host countries. Uh, and in the case, in the context that we're looking in, uh, in Lebanon, we can think of Syrian refugees as an outgroup, uh, despite the fact that, of course, we, you know, Lebanon is hardly a place where we can think of everyone having a shared vision of a national political community. Uh, there are lots of cleavages along various lines, uh, as there are in many other contexts across the world. Uh, 
Um, and, and there is documented evidence of negative attitudes towards Syrian refugees. And this, these attitudes hold irrespective of sect, of socioeconomic class, of education level. So if you look at public opinion data, for example, from the Arab barometer, you'll see that even educated professionals uh, express concerns about uh, Syrian refugees. Um, uh, concerns in terms of their attitudes and also question in regard to questions like, would you want your children to go to school with Syrian refugees and so forth. And, and these negative attitudes um, are at almost the same level regardless of education uh, and professional status. Um, so this would imply for the purposes of our paper that Syrian refugees would experience inferior care in service delivery agencies in comparison with Lebanese nationals. But we know from a variety of literatures and some evidence vis-a-vis -vis the treatment of refugees in, in some contexts that pro-social behavior um, or more generous behavior is possible and this might lead to equal care, fair treatment uh, regardless of national origin in service delivery agencies. Uh, and this can arise for a variety of reasons, uh, which we classify in terms of intrinsic motivations and extrinsic motivations. So intrinsic motivations would include things like altruism or professional values, uh, motivations that come from within the self uh, are not driven by external incentives or factors. Uh, and certainly when we're looking at healthcare professionals, we would expect to see that professional values are relevant here because doctors, of course, and other healthcare professionals take the Hippocratic Oath and are committed to fair treatment of patients. You also might expect that altruistic people would select into serving in uh, healthcare facilities. Um, there also might be extrinsic motivations for equal treatment of refugees in service delivery centers. Uh, and this is documented in studies of healthcare delivery and other service delivery settings. Uh, these might come in the form of financial incentives like fee per patient or something like that, or strategic motivations. Uh, for example, uh, the literature on faith-based organizations and uh, social service delivery suggests that some providers who work in faith-based organizations are motivated to work extra hard because they're very committed to the mission of the organization where they work. So there's a variety of reasons why we might find that in fact, care is equal or equitable across refugees and uh, nationals. Um, so just to give you a little sense of where I'm heading here to tell you the punchline in advance uh, before I go into the evidence for this, um, we find that in uh, Lebanese healthcare centers, Syrians receive equal and under some conditions even better treatment in healthcare centers. And we start to look at why this is the case and we assess a variety of reasons why this might be the case and find some suggested, suggestive evidence that it has to do with incentives coming from partnerships with international NGOs. And I'll explain this more later on in the talk and possibly also public health imperatives, the imperative to uh, control the spread of infectious diseases, which doctors have linked with um, uh, refugee populations. Um, so, so let me tell you a little bit more about what we're doing in this study and how we ended up at these findings. Okay, so, um, so again, our focus is on primary healthcare in Lebanon and uh, in particular, we're focusing on a sector of primary health care in Lebanon that is um, uh, delivers care at subsidized rates. So this is the nonprofit sector, uh, not the for-profit sector where most people with means go to receive treatment. And, uh, and this is a sector in which there are approximately 200 uh, 20 something healthcare facilities that are in an umbrella network overseen by the Ministry of Public Health, but the actual centers are not necessarily public centers. In fact, only about a quarter of them are administered by public sector agencies. The rest are administered by things like political parties or uh, religious uh, charities or non affiliated uh, NGOs, local NGOs not international NGOs. 
Um, so what did we do here to collect our data? We uh, took a representative sample of health centers from this larger group that I just mentioned uh, that amounted to about 69 centers. And we carried out a variety of surveys at the center level. Uh, I should mention that my co-author and I went to Lebanon uh, and uh, recruited with the help of a project manager, a really excellent team of 16 enumerators uh, in Lebanon and trained them and worked with them closely for several weeks uh, before they went out and collected data for the project. And we have in our data set surveys with about 200 doctors uh, that includes uh, a, a general survey with physicians as well as an experimental co component. They're looking at what kind of workplaces or health centers they prefer. We have uh, surveys with exit uh, surveys with about 1,200 patients uh, done when the patients were leaving the healthcare facility. Uh, the enumerators also observed in the clinical examination room about 1,200 medical examinations. Uh, and then there were some additional surveys with the chief medical officers and administrators to follow up and collect more center level data. And then we had, after all this data collection was done, one of the enumerators uh, followed up in a, a random sample of uh, centers uh, selected from where we did this data collection uh, and carried out interviews with doctors. And the important thing to keep in mind is that the data from all of these surveys and from the qualitative interviews can be matched across health centers, doctors, and patients. So we can match you know, the clinical observation of a given patient to a given doctor to a, to a given center. It's all anonymized. Um, and you know, at risk of sounding defensive, I just want to uh, say you know, why we did not randomly assign patients to health centers, uh, which would have enabled us to um, in the minds of some uh, social scientists to collect more clearly uh, causally identified results. Uh, just suffice it to say that it was not politically feasible in this context. And we had some ethical questions about this as well. I'd be happy to get more into that in the Q and A. Um, so uh, so the, we do a variety of things in this paper. Um, the first thing we do in answer to the first question that I highlighted at the beginning is look at whether Syrians receive lower quality care or equal quality care or how the quality of care for Syrians compares to that, that of Lebanese nationals. And we do this uh, by carrying out a variety of multivariate statistical tests with observational data derived from the uh, data that I just described. Um, and then we look at, uh, we try to probe these findings further and try to look at when and why do Syrians receive the care that they receive. And as I mentioned, we find that they receive equal or even superior care. So we use a, uh, we carry out a variety of additional analyses using both quantitative and qualitative data for that. Um, and we try to probe uh, in trying to disentangle what's going on uh, at the center level, whether there's something about different kinds of centers that deliver better care to Syrians, uh, whether doctors that are linked to, that work in centers that are linked to uh, international NGOs, or rather that receive support from international NGOs are different from doctors that work in other types of centers. And also whether there's something about the, the um, epidemiological profiles of refugees that shapes the differential quality of care that they receive. So we do a variety of additional analyses to try to get at these and other potential factors that might explain our results. Um, okay, so just to look at the first set of tests, the um, multivariate statistical tests where we look at the quality of care, the key independent variable in these analyses is whether the patient is Syrian or Lebanese in nationality. Um, and our outcome variable is uh, something that we constructed called the doctor effort index. And it's based on a composite index of the number of questions that doctors asked in clinical examinations the number of physical examinations that they undertook and the number of minutes they spent with uh, patients. And we collectively uh, construct an, an, an index uh, based on these three factors um, using principal component analysis. So let me just say why we're using, why this is a good measure. 
Um, so we're following pretty standard and widely validated measures here in the public health literature on how to measure the quality of care. And, uh, and when we think about what the quality of health care is, it's, it can be conceptualized in a number of different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, we can think of um, equipment and infrastructure as indicative of the quality of care. And we certainly have controls for that in all, in all of our analyses. Um, but we focus on something called process quality. Uh, which is basically what's the quality of care, or what is the kind of interaction between the doctor and the patient, and how much effort is the doctor exerting in providing health care to the patient. And the reason why um, analysts use this as a measure of the quality of care is that you can have the greatest equipment in the world, um, but it's not going to uh, be that important for the quality of care for a patient if the doctor is not working uh, hard and exerting effort and paying attention to the patient and doing the right examinations and so forth. Um, so this is why we use this measure. We could also look at, and we don't do this in this paper, one might look at health outcomes, but one of the reasons we don't do that is because health outcomes is, uh, are, are affected by a wide variety of factors beyond the quality of care in the healthcare faci uh, facility itself. And this is well known based on the literature on the social determinants of care. So that's why we use this kind of process quality measure of the doctor effort index, and we use widely validated measures to come up with this. Um, and then we use a variety of control variables that you might expect. Some of them are demographic controls at the level of the, um, of the patient, uh, the patient age, gender, socioeconomic status, religiosity, um, we also look at health-related controls that have to do with the type of visit. Is this a primary care visit? Is this an obstetric, uh, obstetric visit? What kind of visit is this? We have um, the patient's general health status, which we measure in two ways. One is self-reported health, and the other is the symptoms that were reported as observed during the clinical examinations. And then we try to control for Hawthorne effects or the effects of being observed on doctor effort. Uh, uh, in a way that has been validated in the existing literature by looking at the order of the observed examination of the doctor. And there's evidence that after the doctor has been observed for a while, they forget they're being observed. So you should see a decline in effort over time, uh, you know, as doctors forget about being observed after many uh, observed examinations. Um, and we also control for a number of other factors um, uh, related to the type of the center, whether it's a public sector facility, if it's a secular facility, if it's run by a religious or sectarian political party, and whether the patient is from the same religion or not uh, from that center. Um, and we have we use uh, cluster robust standard errors in these um, in these analyses at the provider level, since the provider is seeing multiple patients in our data, data set. And we also use fixed effects for the enumerators that were observing um, the, uh, the clinical examinations. Um, so this is just a, a, a set of descriptive statistics of our key variables. Um, I won't go into this in great detail, um, but basically, you know, our main independent variable there is um, Syrian and we have, you know, almost 50-50 uh, um, patients in our data set who are Syrian versus uh, Lebanese. And this conforms with estimates of who's visiting these types of centers gathered by other uh, 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 analyses and by international organizations like UNHCR, for example. And then uh, our, you know, the key measures of our, um, of our dependent variables that we use to construct the doctor effort index, and then a variety of control variables. Um, uh, so we do control for these individual level variables. You can see that, you know, on average, patients are a little bit younger and, um, uh, and lower socioeconomic status uh, when they are Syrian rather than Lebanese. Um, okay, so turning to the results of this first question, so what's the quality of care that Syrians versus Lebanese receive when they go to the health centers in our sample? And um, 
And you can see on this table that we break out the results by the different components of our uh, dependent variable, the questions by the doctor, physical examinations, a minute of examination, and then we uh, uh, combine them into the doctor effort index. And the key takeaway here is that there is uh, no difference in the quality of care. There is some difference when you have models without fixed effects, but the minute you put in uh, center level fixed effects or provider level fixed effects, those differences go away. So we see that, um, that, uh, that there really is no difference um, uh, in statistical significance or even real substantive effects. Um, uh, when it, Syrians versus Lebanese go to these health centers, which suggests that there's something about going on at the center level or provider level that washes out um, possible differences. Uh, if anything, um, before we you know, include fixed effects, Syrians seem to get slightly better care. Uh, but again, that goes away when we put in um, these fixed effects for the center at the center and provider level. Um, so, so that you know, raises some questions for us about what's going on here uh, in those centers or with those providers that seem to bring up the, you know, that seem to bring up the average uh, level here and equalize or even uh, provide superior care to um, to uh, Syrians. So. Um, so as I said, we don't see a significant positive coefficient for Syrian when we include fixed effects. Uh, and then we go um, try to look at what might be going on. And here we first look at the kinds of um, factors that you might expect to explain uh, the equal treatment of the outgroup versus the in-group based on literature from social psychology and other sources. Um, and we look at a variety of factors related to altruism, related to professionalism, fi financial incentives, strategic motivations, as I outlined at the outset of the presentation. And we run some analyses looking at whether uh, measures of all of these factors, I'd be happy to talk more about what measures we use from our surveys to get at these factors. Uh, we, we, tr we look at whether measures of these factors moderate the results that we find and we find um, no significant results when we in include potential moderator variables to try to get at these channels that might be explaining what's going on. So, you know, while there are obviously very altruistic and professional doctors in our sample, and we know that there are many selfless um, and uh, excellent uh, doctors uh, serving the refugee community as well as Lebanese, uh, we're not finding that this is what's um, explaining the um, the equality of care or even slight um, uh, improved care for Syrians in our data set. Um, so then we try to start looking for other things um, and, 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 and turn to um, the one possible answer related to the role of international organizations operating in Lebanon. And as I'm sure you're well aware, in many contexts in which there are humanitarian crises, international NGOs play a really critical role in helping uh, to relieve um, humanitarian uh, needs and also to support uh, local institutions in meeting those needs. And that is certainly the case in Lebanon. It's been well documented that international NGOs play a key role. And this is particularly important during crisis periods like during the Lebanese Civil War and at various points since then when there have been crises. Um, and so in the case of Lebanon, uh, there's emerging, and I think it was 2015, um, there was a, a, an enhanced coordination of international humanitarian efforts between the UNHCR, the WHO, and the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health, among other bodies. And they formed this Lebanese Crisis Response Plan, the LCRP, which helped uh, you know, to really systematize the response of humanitarian efforts in the country. And this, other people have written about this and described this process in great detail. Um, and so what we saw was that um, as a result of this crisis response plan, um, that international NGOs such as the UNHCR formed partnerships with existing centers in precisely the health network that we are studying. Um, so, um, 
So what they did was they provided subsidies to these centers to assist them in providing care because all these centers, I should mention, that are in our sample are the ones that are at the front lines of providing care to Syrian refugees. They'd already been working to provide care to Lebanese citizens. And prior to the uh, Syrian refugee crisis, as a result of the war in Syria, the Ministry of Public Health had been, had been um, doing a lot to improve the quality of care in these centers and uh, had been working with the World Bank uh, and other agencies to try to roll out a universal health care plan to support the neediest Lebanese uh, through these very centers that we're studying. Uh, and it's also these centers, as I mentioned, that are providing care to, uh, to Syrian refugees. So this um, LCRP uh, crisis response plan uh, helped to coordinate support to centers that were, um, that were gonna support refugees and that were receiving lots of refugees. Uh, and that came in material uh, uh, enhancements with subsidies and the provision of equipment and some kind of uh, guidance on various medical practices and so forth. And, uh, and some of these partnerships were directly funded by the UNHCR. Um, so, uh, so we have uh, data on which centers in our data set were in partnership with the LCRP receiving support to uh, support their efforts in meeting the healthcare needs of Syrians. So then we start looking at whether centers that are affiliated with international NGOs through the LCRP deliver better care to Syrians. Uh, and so what we find here um, is uh, that indeed we do find that, um, that those centers that are in a partnership with um, an, uh, an LCRP partnered uh, um, uh, that are in, an, uh, in a partnership with an international NGO through this Lebanese crisis response plan do indeed uh, bring up the average of care delivered to Syrians in our data set. So, so what this shows, what this figure shows is um, the average marginal effect of being a Syrian in a center with a partnership um, that receives this, these kinds of subsidies and support um, and there is indeed, um, you know, greater uh, uh, care delivered to Syrians in these centers um, than in to Syrians that are in a center without such a partnership. And there are some meaningful substantive effects here. They get asked more questions uh, in the clinical examinations. Um, there's more physical examinations uh, and, um, and more time spent with patients. Um, and we don't see this difference in non-partnered centers. So we see some evidence for an effect of improved care for Syrians in these kinds of centers. Um, and so then the question is, well, what's going on here? Is there something different about the kinds of doctors that work in these centers? Uh, you know, how can we disentangle what's going on? Um, maybe doctors that work in these partnered centers, these centers that form partnerships with international NGOs to serve Syrians, uh, have more favorable views of Syrians. And we don't see evidence of this. this is, um, these are some findings from a conjoint experiment that we embedded in the survey that we ran with doctors. And in that uh, survey, we had um, an experiment that asked them uh, about what type of health center they'd like to work in. And we include a variety of attributes that might shape doctor preferences to work in one type of center over another. Some of them are sort of standard things like, you know, better equipment or geographic proximity to my, uh, to my place of residence or my office um, or a variety of other uh, factors that you might expect that are rather intuitive. And one of the attributes that we include is whether they prefer to work in centers that have mostly Syrian patients or other mixes of patients. And we basically find, as this figure shows, no difference in the types of doctors or in the attitudes of doctors towards Syrians, to whether they work in a partnered center or not. So that's the key takeaway of this figure here. Um, and so we don't find evidence that there's something about doctors, you know, with having better views of Syrians in these partnered centers or not. 
Um, so then we look at other factors that might distinguish the doctors that work in these uh, international NGO affiliated centers. Um, are they more altruistic? Are they more professionalized? Um, do they you know, ex exhibit greater commitment to professional ethics or professional or interest in pursuing professional development opportunities? We have a variety of measures of this. And um, I won't show the results here, but we don't find evidence for those factors based on simple bivariate um, regressions. Um, but we do find some evidence that doctors who work in uh, NGO, international NGO affiliated centers report higher levels of job satisfaction. And um, in a moment, I'll talk about what we think is going on here and why this job satisfaction is consistent with our argument about uh, the, what we call the INGO effect, the effect of working in an international NGO or a center affiliated with an uh, NGO. Um, so, uh, so then we want to look more, you know, look at other factors uh, that might explain how uh, uh, a partnership with an international NGO leads to the superior care in these centers. And um, let me just remind you that we had follow-up interviews with a random uh, sample of centers from our uh, original um, sample. And these were actually incredibly illuminating interviews. Uh, one of the enumerators from our team conducted these interviews and she did a, a really fantastic job carrying them out and we learned quite a bit from them. So I'm gonna share some of the information we gleaned from these interviews and uh, use that information to try to explain what's going on here. So uh, a number of the interviews we conducted pointed to the benefits of, uh, of Syrian patients for centers and for, uh, and for also the uh, resources that were funneled into centers that served Syrian refugees. Uh, so one doctor in our interviews said centers that help a lot of Syrian patients are prospering, leading to the subsequent advancement of the center. As a result, they're contributing to increasing the influx of patients to the center. So this suggests that there's actually some kind of advantage in getting more Syrian patients to the center, and this would incentivize centers and doctors that work at those centers to really pay attention to those Syrians. Um, here's another quote in that vein. Doctors took advantage of this situation and saw it as an opportunity. The displacement period, so the refugee crisis, was refreshing for primary health care centers. Some centers got support and echography machines that, couldn't get, that they couldn't get before. Other centers got specialists, doctors hired, and other benefits. It's a motivating factor to see more patients. Um, and then finally, when international organizations stopped helping primary health care centers with Syrian patients, as happened in some instances, um, like they used to at first, the level of care dropped. The Lebanese healthcare system cannot help Syrian patients on its own. And I should underscore here that, and I should have said this at the outset, that um, I, I think it's well known that the Syrian refugee crisis has had a massive, massive effect on Lebanon. And on a per capita basis, Lebanon has received the highest number of refugees in the world. Uh, and so the system, all kinds of systems in Lebanon have been strained and certainly the healthcare system, which was already strained as it was. Uh, so, you know, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the healthcare system needs support in order to be able to cater to the influx of refugees. Um, so collectively, these quotes suggest that there's uh, perhaps some extrinsic motivations, as we outlined at the outset, that might be shaping the superior care that these INGO-affiliated or partnered centers might be providing to Syrian patients. Um, and these might come in the form of financial incentives uh, or, or that sort of thing. Um, but that still raises the question of what's going on in the rest of the centers that don't have partnerships, because there too, we don't find that Syrians are be being treated worse in these centers. We find actually evidence for equal care in the non-partnered centers, in the centers that are not receiving subsidies or other forms of support from international NGOs. So what's going on? And here we find support uh, um, we, we have some tentative evidence in, in favor of a, another 
factor that might be explaining this. Um, and so drawing on those interviews, uh, here's one uh, quote. Doctors have to give the same quality of care to Syrians and Lebanese in order to prevent the spread of infectious diseases to the rest of the population. They consider it as this way. They will protect the Lebanese population. So, um, so I want to point out that, um, you know, at the time that uh, we were doing this study, and over a period of a, a few years, there was a spike in communicable diseases in Syria, which we know happens in wartime quite a bit. War is associated, of course, with the degradation of health outcomes, you know, obviously mortality, also morbidity, um, and the breakdown of healthcare systems and so forth. And this was definitely, has definitely been the case in Syria as a number of studies have documented. Um, and this also puts pressure on neighboring countries that have received uh, refugees from Syria. And one example is this um, communicable disease that um, was spreading in the Syrian refugee population called leishmaniasis. And of course, refugees are marginalized, living under extremely difficult circumstances for the most part, and are living in places where it's much harder uh, to practice, you know, good hygiene and there's there's worse sanitation system and so forth. So it becomes easier for communicable diseases to spread. Uh, and this is typical in many wartime situations and was happening in the case of Lebanon at the time when we were carrying out data collection. And, and the other thing I want to mention is that in these follow up interviews, the vast majority of doctors pointed to the threat of communicable diseases as one reason for the nature of care that was being delivered to Syrian refugees. Uh, and, and this was unprompted. We did not have a question on this. These were open-ended interviews and these references to the threat of the spread of communicable diseases came through unprompted in the vast majority of these interviews. Um, and um, we do find some support for this in follow-up analyses that we did of, of the data at hand. Basically, we show here uh, the average marginal effects of a Syrian that is exhibiting dermatological symptoms, which are uh, emblematic of this health condition, leishmaniasis, um, and uh, in centers that don't have these partnerships, you know, where we find evidence of equal care. Uh, and basically, we, we show this, the findings suggest that when patients come into the center with the same symptoms, you know, like rash symptoms, and they are Syrian versus Lebanese, the doctors tend to spend more time treating the Syrians who are more likely to have this condition. So we do, we draw on some of the data that we have on the symptoms that patients are reporting to try to look at whether we see more effort uh, exerted by doctors in treating the kinds of symptoms that are associated with this particular uh, health condition that was um, breaking out at the time of data collection and that so many doctors referred to in the follow-up interviews uh, unprompted um, by the interviewer. Um, so this is, you know, obviously not smoking gun evidence, but it does seem to be in line with what we were hearing from an overwhelming number of doctors. Um, so, so let me just pull this all together. I mean, I've thrown a lot of kind of information at you and I wanna pull this all together to think about what this means for the treatment of refugees and humanitarian crises and how we're interpreting these findings and what they suggest for, um, for humanitarian response and, and studies of uh, the treatment of refugees and, and so forth. Um, so the first thing is uh, we seem to find support for uh, the importance of a relationship or support from uh, international NGOs in conflict affected countries. And I know that you know, th this is controversial because there's mixed evidence on what in international organizations do in conflict affected contexts and, um, and there's you know, many excellent studies that find sort of mixed uh, results based on what NGOs do when they come in from abroad into conflict affected contexts. So here, um, you know, we find that, um, that international NGOs have played an important role in providing resources for addressing the crisis, uh, which again has been a very severe crisis uh, in, in particular in Lebanon, 
uh, given the you know, sheer volume of, um, of the effects on, on the country. Um, and, and, uh, and so what do we think is going on here in terms of why doctors and centers that have support from international NGOs might be exerting more effort? Well, um, international NGOs are you know, critical providers of resources and arguably organizations, local organizations that benefit from partnerships with them have an incentive to perform well because they may you know, need or want to access resources from NGOs in the future. So they want to establish and maintain good relationships with international NGOs so that they can be on the list of centers or organizations to, uh, for future partnerships. So that's kind of a center level set of uh, incentives why you might see uh, centers or organizations with international partnerships performing better. But also at the individual level, uh, for doctors or other types of educated professionals, there's good reason to think that there's an important incentive to perform well when you're working in one of these centers. Um, and uh, sociologists and others have pointed to something called international, I'm sorry, internal brain drain as a possible explanation for this. So we're all familiar with the concept of brain drain, you know, in which uh, educated professionals leave their home country to go abroad to seek better opportunities, and that has a negative impact on their countries of origin. But some have argued that there is also a phenomenon called internal brain drain, whereby educated professionals seek jobs in international NGOs uh, in order to um, have more prestigious jobs or jobs with higher salaries and, and improved benefits and so forth. And so this may be part of what's going on is that there's an incentive to work in places that have these partnerships and to perform better when you do work in one so that you can maintain a relationship with them or you know, be considered for future job opportunities with international NGOs based in the country, uh, the host country. So that might be one factor that's going on that's driving our results. Um, the other thing related to the uh, finding about um, the urgency of treating patients who might have communicable diseases is that public health threats or perceived public health threats might drive provider effort uh, in, in humanitarian uh, response contexts. And uh, this might even uh, compel providers to uh, uh, exert greater effort with patients, not from the national community or from their own communities, but to uh, patients from outside of their own communities. Uh, and, and I raise this, you know, point of potentially overriding in-group bias because there's been a lot of evidence in studies of diversity and public goods provision that, um, that public goods provision is uh, enhanced when it is provided in more homogeneous groups or when people are uh, catering to their own communities. But it's possible that uh, when there is a perceived life or death situation or some kind of urgent public health threat that you see providers performing uh, at an extra level of effort um, with, with uh, people from outside their own communities to try to combat this perceived or actual threat. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that, you know, we're reporting average effects here. So we're not denying that altruism or professionalism plays a role here, but there may be other incentives or other factors at play that helps to explain, that help to explain the findings that we uh, come up with. Um, so just to wrap up, um, uh, you know, we find some evidence um, of negative attitudes against Syrians, even among Lebanese doctors. I don't report it here in, in my presentation, but we have some evidence um, that this is the case among Lebanese doctors. Uh, this is certainly shown to be true in the public health literature on racial congruence. Um, so in particular, there's been a number of studies, including a very recent study that show um, that there's a, a, a better care um, when providers and patients are from the same racial group in the United States. And there's been increasing uh, attention to this kind of finding uh, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and in the COVID-19 crisis, which has shown uh, 
uh, disproportionate um, uh, impact on communities of color in the United States. So there's been more and more attention to this kind of public health uh, research on racial concordance in the United States. So I raise this only to say that we have evidence in other contexts that even healthcare providers who take the Hippocratic Oath and are you know, professional and, um, and often very altruistic do have uh, some negative attitudes uh, towards outgroup members. And this manifests in a variety of ways having to do with you know, thinking that patients from a different racial or ethnic group, or in this case, national group, might be uh, less educated or less inclined to comply with medical advice and, and so forth. And we actually find evidence of these kinds of attitudes in our interview data and a little bit in our quantitative data. And again, the, the survey data from Lebanon suggests that this might be the case. Um, so I raise all of this to say that we might see a mismatch between attitudes that uh, doctors and other healthcare professionals have and their actual behavior in delivering care, because we don't find any evidence of inferior effort, even though we find some evidence of negative attitudes. Um, and also that this possible diversity deficit, you know, when providers serve people not from their own communities, might be offset by other factors of the kinds that I've talked about here today, um, such as it exists. And so I think what this raises some important issues to consider when we think about the politics of humanitarian response and related questions. One is, you know, should we care about attitudes? Maybe, you know, obviously the most important thing is how, um, how, uh, how, healthcare professionals behave in their delivery of healthcare or services. Uh, so maybe the more important thing is behavior. And, uh, and perhaps over time with more and more exposure to patients from other communities, uh, healthcare professionals and others develop more uh, positive attitudes towards members of the outgroup, in this case, refugees. That's something we obviously cannot tackle here, but it's possible that over time attitudes change uh, after behavior has changed. Um, and then the other thing I want to highlight is we're not trying to say that, you know, the sort of policy prescription or panacea is, oh, bring in international organizations. Um, first of all, there's, you know, really excellent efforts by local NGOs and, um, and the Ministry of Public Health and other government bodies to address the, um, the health, the refugee crisis and uh, healthcare delivery challenges in Lebanon. Uh, and so even if we find a positive effect of support uh, from international organizations, obviously this is not a long-term solution and you know, international organizations are not as sustainable as building up local capacity. Um, so so we, we think you know, there is a, a positive effect in terms, of, um, in terms of the immediate delivery of care, but it's not a, a long-term solution necessarily. So thank you so much. I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Perfect, thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, we're gonna take some questions now. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll read them out. Um, it looks like we have one first question from Sam DeCanio. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk. Can you speak a little bit about whether there are any patterns in the kinds of refugees that arrive in Lebanon versus other countries such as Turkey? Are they more or less educated? Are they from specific sects? Do they have social networks in Lebanon? Similarly, does Lebanon's unique religious composition have any implications for how Syrian refugees are treated relative to other countries, perhaps with fewer religious divisions? Okay, great questions. I mean, I don't have sort of systematic evidence here, but I can say a little bit based on, you know, what I've been following. Um, um, so I can't say whether there's much variation in uh, the types of refugees that go to Lebanon versus Turkey, but I will say that overwhelmingly the uh, refugees tend to be from the Sunni Muslim community more than from other communities. Um, and if you're following the dynamics of the Syrian conflict, this makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, what we do, what we find actually in another paper derived from this project is that we don't see variation in care 
uh, based on whether refugees, Syrian refugees from one religion go to this type of center versus that type of center versus that type of center. We don't see variation there. Uh, so if for to be more concrete, if we see a Sunni Syrian going to a Christian center versus a Sunni, Sunni healthcare center, because as I mentioned, some of these centers are run by religious organizations, we don't see any variation in care. At, at, we actually do see some evidence in variation of care for Lebanese nationals when they go to a center not from their own religious community, but we don't find this for the case of Syrians. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about why that might be the case. Um, but again, the overwhelming number of refugees are from the Sunni community. Um, and, uh, and there are certainly um, uh, Syrians of many different um, economic and educational profile, of different economic and educational profiles coming into Lebanon. Um, and so, you know, some of the refugees have been quite wealthy and, you know, are going to restaurants and that sort of thing. This is obviously the minority of Syrians uh, that have come over. Now, there have also been middle class Syrians that have come over uh, into Lebanon from, uh, from Syria. But, you know, what's very sad, and some have pointed to the fact that there isn't much attention to this in studies of Syrian refugees, uh, this group, it has been hard hit in particular ways because they were not initially eligible for some of the support coming out of UNHCR and other kinds of organizations because they were above certain income thresholds. And so they had to pay for healthcare needs and food and other things out of pocket while facing labor um, market restrictions. So they were not able to work and make money for the most part, at least not in the formal sector. And so middle-class Syrians have suffered a lot and have, you know, in, in many cases blown through their life savings and have found themselves, you know, really declining in socioeconomic status. So again, there's, you know, broad variation in the types that have come over with respect to education and socioeconomic status, but I think it's been, you know, precarious in different ways for uh, low income, low SES and middle income uh, uh, Syrians. Um, so I, think that gets at some of these questions here. Great, thanks so much. Um, we have another question here. Uh, thank you for your talk, really interesting. You mentioned that your findings seem to normalize when you applied fixed effects and that you chose your fixed effects from standard applicable ones, if I understood you correctly. Um, could you elaborate on this methodology and are you happy that the read across from say US utilization of these fixed effects is fully relevant in different areas of the global south. Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's the methodology is appropriate because we're able to say compare, you know, a Syrian versus a Lebanese seeing the same provider in the same center. So that helps to control for certain things. Otherwise we'd have, you know, too many things, moving parts going. Um, and, um, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, um, there may be unanticipated unobservable factors that we, um, that we don't address by virtue of the fact that we didn't randomly assign patients to go to, you know, different types of centers, for example. Uh, and we're unable to do so. Um, but I feel pretty confident that these findings are robust because there's even more tests that we, you know, I didn't talk about here today that are in the supplemental appendix of the paper that really show that the findings are robust to a lot of different specifications and pretty rigorous ones like block bootstrapping and all kinds of other things. So, so we've sort of sliced and diced these um, these results using any number of different specifications. And I don't see any reason why these kinds of approaches would be more applicable in one context versus another. Um, and we did work very extensively with um, local partners um, uh, to design all of these instruments and actually ran um, versions of the instruments by colleagues at the um, uh, Faculty of Health Sciences at the American University of Beirut and also worked with the Ministry of Public Health on some of the instruments to make sure that they were locally valid uh, and were, you know, asking questions in a way that was appropriate for this particular context. 
even though we originally got some of the sort of broader methodological approaches from the public health literature. In particular, the, the, if we're talking about the main outcomes of interest, like doctor effort index and you know, number of questions asked and all these sorts of things, these, this kind of approach was actually developed by researchers who work in developing countries. Um, so, so, you know, in places where you don't have access to electronic medical records and things like this, where you can look at the quality of care through electronic records and trace this, there's um, more appropriate ways to measure healthcare quality are along the lines of what we've done here. And so, um, so some of the studies where we, um, you know, first adapted our instruments from are derived from the work of um, an economist at the World Bank named Jishnu Das and a variety of his collaborators. And they started these um, surveys in India and then spread out across a variety of developing countries like um, Tanzania and um, various Latin American countries. So they've been this kind of approach of measuring the quality of care has been derived in developing countries and tested in a variety of different contexts. And then we worked on with uh, partners to, um, to make sure that they fit the Lebanese epidemiological context and social and political context as well. Right, thanks so much. Next question is, would you draw any lessons for institutional design from your findings at the UN or country level? Hmm. Um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I do think we do find evidence that the kinds of um, support that the UNHCR and other partners have funneled to centers uh, has resulted in improved quality of care for Syrians. And I guess that's not a shocking finding in that, um, in that, um, you know, when you are receiving more resources and subsidies and so forth, um, that you're more likely to be able to deliver a higher standard of care. Um, and, and we also believe that there's incentives why this might be the case for centers and doctors at those places to perform well. Um, I, I should also note that we also look at whether centers that have the international support are doing a better job at monitoring doctor behavior. We have a variety of measures of monitoring at the facility level and at, at different levels. And we find no difference in, in the amount of monitoring that goes on in doctor behavior. We have, um, I can get into the nitty gritty of that, but we don't see any difference there. Um, so, so, um, so I guess what I would take away is that this partnership that the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health put in place with the UNHCR and the WHO seems to have brought up the quality of care so that uh, Syrians are able to access decent quality of care, at least on par with Lebanese nationals. And so there is possibly a lesson there that the partnership has been effective. Um, obviously, again, this is not like a long-term solution to fixing the Lebanese public health system but it seems to have worked well in a humanitarian crisis response setting. Thanks so much. The next question is um, two questions around your measure of whether there is an in-group bias. First, your measure of quality as effort may vary with need. So doctors need to ask questions about gassing of Syrians, but not Lebanese. And in a sense, your public health argument is a version of this point, making measurement of quality sensitive to need, which will vary between Lebanese and Syrians. And the second question is, the baseline of Syrian treatment levels for comparison will likely comprise some combination of in-group and out-group biases, given the heterogeneity of the Syrian population. Okay. Um, well, I... You know, we do include measures um, and control variables that allow, if I understand this question correctly, um, so let me know if, I, if I'm not getting it, um, that do allow us to control for health status. So there's no question that Syrians are in a worse situation on average, um, you know, socioeconomically, which correlates with health status as well. Uh, but we include a number of measures that allow us to control for that, like the symptoms reported and self-reported health status and so forth. So I think we're, we're trying to get at that. Um, 
And, um, and again, we don't see evidence of sort of in-group, out-group biases. If by in-group, out-group, we're talking about religion and sect, uh, um, uh, we don't see evidence for that with respect to Syrians. Um, interestingly, in another paper, we find some evidence that that plays out with respect to Lebanese nationals. Uh, and I can, you know, argue, introduce some arguments about why that might be the case, but we just don't see it for Syrians. Um, and, uh, and, and if by in-group, out-group, we're talking about nationality, Syrian versus Lebanese, that's exactly what we're trying to tap into in these analyses. Like whether being, these are, and, you know, and I realized I did not explain uh, important things about the doctor population here that helps to interpret these findings. So let me just say that these are all Lebanese nationals working in these facilities. They're all Lebanese doctors and they all have uh, work, they don't work full time for the most part in these centers. They work uh, for a, you know, a fixed number of hours per week and they vary in terms of their compensation structure. And so that's why we put in variables to test whether the financial compensation structure might affect the quality of care delivered. Because some of them are working on a more voluntary basis, some of them are working on a fee per patient or uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so obviously if you're working on a fee per patient basis, you have an incentive to you know, work uh, more and to deliver care um, if you're gonna get more patients and deliver quality of care. So we control for all that and don't find that that's explaining or moderating our effects. Um, so so I, I think we do address different kinds of in-group, out-group biases potentially, and, and that's what we're trying to get at here. Great. Um, next question. Thank you so much for the talk. A few small questions. First, what did the centers and doctors know about the project? Did they know that the observations of their work or interaction with patients were related to differences in groups? And as regards the being observed effect on doctors, is it possible to validate some of the items in the index by looking at some at the same variables, but measured outside the period of observation. For instance, the number of physical examinations per patient, which a, which a record uh, may exist of. And might there be some sort of self-selection in the case of these centers? That is, might you get a particular type of doctor uh, with little variation between the doctors in the category in these centers that attract a considerable number of refugees? And finally, do you have any data on the number of months and years of doctors have worked in these centers? Might there be a socialization effect in terms of dealing with patients with different nationalities? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'll try to get at all these great questions. Um, so, um, so we do, okay, regarding the observation effect. Um, so one way I might answer that is we do interact our Hawthorne effect variable with patient nationality and it doesn't change the results. So um, whether you're treating a Syrian or a Lebanese doesn't change the effect there. Um, and the validation of the items in the index. So, um, so, you know, a couple of things there. We do feel, um, you know, pretty confident in this, not only based on the existing literature that we're drawing on this measure, these measures have been validated extensively elsewhere, but we also see that when patients have more symptoms or worse symptoms or more worse self-reported health, you see higher doctor effort index. So that's another way of kind of validating this measure and finding support for that. Um, we have not looked at, you know, these kinds of measures outside the period of observation. I don't know if they're available, but that's worth looking at, um, you know, because I'm not aware of other studies that have been carried out of this nature. It was, you know, really labor intensive to do this study. It would require, I should say that, you know, each um, data collection effort per center required like three to five days because, you know, the team would have to go out and, and do some, uh, you know, and try to get it done in one day. And so it was, it was a huge effort to get data collected at the 68, 69 centers um, with all of these instruments. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not aware of other studies that have done quite this in this context, but you know, they may be out there and we should check uh, and we can see what other kinds of measures are available from other sources. Um, and in terms of self-selection, 
So absolutely, you know, the LCRP, the Lebanese Crisis Response Plan, did uh, select certain centers to be the beneficiaries of these subsidies, equipment, et cetera, et cetera, of the plan. Um, and this was based on a variety of factors uh, having to do with the density of uh, refugee settlements in the area uh, and, and, and those sorts of factors, like were they proximate to concentrations of Syrian refugees in particular. But again, we do try to look at you know, in a variety of ways, all these different ways in which doctors that work in these partner centers and don't work in these partner centers might differ from each other. And we're just not finding many differences except in this job satisfaction variable, which correlates, or, or I would say is in um, alignment with this sort of internal brain drain argument that, um, that there's a preference to work in centers linked to the International NGO Center because you wanna get in good with these kinds of organizations in terms of future opportunities and um, you know, better benefits and, and so forth. So, um, so that's the one area where we've seen a difference, but we haven't seen a difference in terms of commitment to professionalization or altruism or this sort of thing. So I, I think that gets at that question. Um, we do have data on the number, the amount of time doctors have worked in these centers. And I believe we include this in the analyses, um, but I have to double check, but we certainly have that, that data as well. Great. Um, we don't have any more Q&A questions. Um, Mark, did you have a question? I think there is another question in the, uh, the webinar chat. Oh, uh, sorry, missed that one. Um, so that question is, are there any differences in care based upon the type of health problems patients are exhibiting? For example, do doctors offer the same amount of care to Syrians and Lebanese as the severity of a patient's disease or the cost of treatment increases? Basically, I'm wondering if there is any evidence that bias in treatment increases as the costs of care or treatment increases. Um, so, from what we can do with our analyses, we don't find evidence of that, you know, by controlling for the types of symptoms that the patient presents or self-reported health status or these sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and so we're not finding evidence of that. Um, and I should also say that we, I mentioned this conjoint experiment where we tried to look at the factors that shape doctor preferences to work in different kinds of centers. And we do find evidence that they don't like to work in centers across the board, whether they work in an INGO partnered center or not, that have lots of Syrians. And that's controlling for, that's like net of a whole bunch of other factors, including, you know, the, the like patient load and, and uh, circumstances at the center and that sort of thing. So, um, so as far as we can tell, based on controlling for types of symptoms, disease, type of visit also, whether it's an obstetric, obstetric visit, um, and there definitely are more pregnancy related visits for Syrian refugees than Lebanese at these centers, but controlling for all these factors, like the type of visit we don't, you know, our results still hold. So, so it should address that kind of question. Um, but there definitely are, as you, as your question implies, um, differences in what Syrians present versus what Lebanese present. But again, we try to address those. Um, yeah. So I, I do have a question, Melanie, and it, it really reflects more my ignorance about the, about the topic. So you're telling us here what is a kind of um, equality story that, at least in this area, we've got relatively consistent results in terms of the way people are treated, irrespective of whether they're an in-group or an out-group. Mm -hmm. How profound is the contrast between the, these cases and the other sorts of cases where you do normally have in-group, out-group differences? So when you've done work in, these, uh, in the Middle East in the past, have you found there to be very, very significant in-group, out-differences? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not, I'm just trying to contextualize it, just how yeah. significant are these results in relation to that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a great question, and I'll just maybe answer it generally. Um, 
you know, and as many of you are probably aware, there's this enormous literature in the social sciences that looks at um, all kinds of economic outcomes and social outcomes when you're in diverse versus homogeneous communities. Yeah. And it's become sort of the conventional wisdom that outcomes are worse in diverse communities for a variety of reasons. Um, although there's some really important and interesting work pushing back against this finding now um, and finding that things, it might have more to do with marginalized status rather than mixed communities and so forth. Um, but leaving all that aside, um, so I think there is evidence that, um, that the diversity deficit, so to speak, is operational. And so maybe I'll just say a few words about another paper we've written out of this study. And again, not random assignment, which you know, we could not do for a variety of reasons, but um, we've done you know, sort of, I think, backflips to try to support the observational findings. And we do find evidence that when Lebanese nationals go to facilities outside of their community, which I should note they do on very rare occasions, um, they, uh, they do tend to receive worse care using these same objective measures. Um, and again, uh, they, they, um, they tend to go to either unaffiliated centers uh, with no affiliation whatsoever along religious or political lines, and when they do go to one that has a religious or political affiliation, they overwhelmingly go to one from the community they're from. So the first step is that there's just self-selection effects, you know, so it's hard to kind of, um, that's why in theory, random assignment would be really great because we could, you know, get a more representative sample. Um, but we do, you know, have enough to make some tentative findings and we do find evidence that it is actually worse and so why, you might ask, is it the case that when Lebanese go to in-group centers, they get better care, but it doesn't seem to hold with Syrians? So what we think is going on, and we have evidence for this from this same data collection effort, is that uh, there is more of an in-group network effect going on with Lebanese nationals. So when you're from Lebanon, this is not a huge country, um, social networks are very deep and articulated and social networks the world over tend to run along in-group lines. Like you tend to affiliate more with people from your own community, however you describe that community. And uh, lots of research, lots of research has suggested that these kinds of informal networks, what we might call informal types of governance, are uh, uh, important in driving all kinds of outcomes, in, including the type of outcome we look at, like the quality of care delivered. So when you're from the same social network, there's a kind of implicit monitoring going on and a more, more accountability going on as uh, you know, we're more likely to know people in common and, uh, and you might feel like, ah, I've got to perform better for this person whose cousin knows my cousins, whatever, or you know, we're from the same you know, village or whatever it might be. So, so those kinds of informal accountability mechanisms may be at play when we're talking about Lebanese nationals, where there is an opportunity for in-group social networks to form and develop over time. But when you're a refugee coming in, you know, you might be from the same religion as the provider or center you're going to, but you're not going to have those kinds of networks. So it's not religion that's doing the work, it's social networks that happen to go along religious lines, and those networks are developed in the Lebanese national community, but not in a refugee population. So that's why I don't think we find that variation there. And we even have a question that um, the, in the, um, that was in the instrument that enumerators used during clinical observations, asking whether the patient and the doctor mentioned a common acquaintance or shared social network. And we use that as a, potential, as a mediator in our uh, analyses and find that that explains part of the quality you know, um, improvement when you are from the same community and you're Lebanese. And we just don't see that same effect with Syrians. So, I think it conforms with one of the major mechanisms in the literature on diversity and uh, public goods provision, which has to do with informal governance, informal social accountability. Thanks very much, Melanie. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming up in the Q&A. Um, I guess I have one final question, unless people want to ask some more. Um, I guess part of the story that you're telling is that 
um, there's this really interesting collaboration between kind of international level governance and directly down to the local level of service provision. Um, and you didn't discuss kind of too much of the role of the state itself, um, or I guess maybe there's perhaps a deficit in, in the provision of kind of healthcare or governance over healthcare. So is it is part of the story also that in, in some ways international level institutions can in, in some ways compensate for national level um, deficits in governance? Yeah, so this is where it gets a little tricky and controversial, right, because this is this is sort of a hot button topic and, um, you know, international organizations often go in and, you know, there's been important research showing that there's, uh, you know, the international organizations often come in and don't have good local contextual knowledge and so forth and, um, you know, apply one size fits all recipes and so forth. Um, so here, um, uh, I'll maybe, first speak to the role, um, you know, this kind of partnership question and then get to the role of the state more generally. But here I think we might be finding evidence of a constructive partnership between um, a government agency, in this case, the Ministry of Public Health and international organizations. And, you know, there's a lot of very competent people in the Ministry of Public Health. Um, I know people, uh, you know, are not always happy with the healthcare delivery and the performance of the ministry and other government agencies, but there's a lot of competent people in there working under very difficult circumstances and, um, and they have worked constructively both with um, local uh, providers, non-state providers and with international organizations. So this might be a story of, at least in this case, for the kinds of outcomes we're looking at, uh, a productive collaboration in which um, they've been able to work uh, side by side and leverage this network of the ministry of, that the Ministry of Public Health oversees, but doesn't necessarily directly run at the clinic level um, to work constructively with international organizations. Um, more generally, when we think of the case of Lebanon, this is not exactly a case of you know, high state capacity on many measures, um, you know, it's a it's a state that never had a huge role for the public sector in the economy, unlike many other Middle East, North African countries. Um, although it plays a bigger role than many people realize because the state has been heavily involved in financing service delivery, if not the direct delivery. The problem is the state has not always been able to effectively regulate the delivery of services. So. Uh, even if it doesn't provide directly, you know, ideally it would be able to regulate effectively and it hasn't always been able to do that. I think there's evidence that the, the state and the health sector has been able to boost regulatory capacity, particularly with these um, uh, non-state uh, facilities that we're looking at um, in, in this uh, Ministry of Public Health umbrella network of healthcare centers. So there's been, there have been some studies that we cite in our paper showing that, you know, through various accreditation processes, they've been able to improve the quality of care over time in these very facilities that tend to serve lower income populations and that have also received a lot of Syrian refugees. So, um, and, and, you know, I'm aware that we're actually not the only ones that have found um, that the treatment of refugees in these facilities has been relatively equitable. I've heard of other studies that find some similar results. Right, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think that might be all for the night. Um, Mark, any final comments or words? Uh, no, I just wanted to give a very special thanks to Melanie for speaking to us. We were chatting before about how how difficult it is doing these um, presentations uh, in this format. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for such a clear and compelling uh, presentation to us um, here today. So thank you very much, Melanie. Um, and thank you to those who've attended and, and asked such great questions, I think. So I hope everybody's enjoyed it and hope to see you all next time. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Christina Bicchieri who will be speaking about uh, social norms and nudging. So please do join us for that. And then finally, just to say thanks again to Melanie for such a great, a great talk this evening.